Jungian synchronicity poses a counter-question to scientific minds. Do we find a reasonable probability that there's nothing more than cause and effect? The discoveries of physics have shattered the absolute validity of natural law and made it relative. Natural laws are completely valid only when we are dealing with macrophysical quantities, which are statistical truths. Whereas when it comes to the infinitesimal world, its prediction becomes uncertain as they no longer behave according to the known natural laws. Since causality presupposes the existence of space and time and all our observations are ultimately based upon bodies in motion, if the knowledge of the connection between cause and effect, the acknowledgement, on which all our certainty with the world rests, turns out to be only statistically valid and hence only relatively true, then the causal principle would be only of relative use for the explanation of its processes. The problem of synchronicity has puzzled Jung since he was in his mid-twenties. There were a number of occasions in which he found what he had experienced as mere coincidences were connected so meaningfully, and their chance concurrence represented a degree of improbability that would have to be expressed in an astronomical figure. One day Jung was treating his patient. This patient, a young woman, at her critical moment, told him that she had a dream. The dream in which she was given a golden scarab, and while she was telling him about the dream, he noticed a noise of gentle tapping from the window pane. He turned around and found that it was a fairly large flying insect trying to get into the room. So he opened the window and caught it in the air as it flew in. It was a scarabeid beetle which was the nearest analogy to a golden scarab that one could find in the area. He then handed the beetle to the patient, saying, here is your scarab. This patient has been psychologically inaccessible despite many efforts made due to her namely a highly polished Cartesian rationalism with an impeccably geometrical idea of reality. He said however this very strange experience punctured the desired hole in her rationalism and broke the ice of her intellectual resistance, and subsequently satisfactory results could be obtained from the treatment. He recalled that nothing like this ever happened to him before or since, and this incident made his patient's dream remain very unique in his experience. Jung gives another example of a synchronistic event cited by Kant in his letter to Charlotte von Knobloch. In his letter, Kant describes how Swedenborg, while he was in Gothenburg which was 300 miles away from Stockholm, had a vision of the great fire of Stockholm, and how hour after hour he reported the progress of the fire to the public. And it was two days later, a messenger arrived in Gothenburg bringing the news of the great Stockholm fire on his horseback. Jung also mentions one of the collected stories of the German author Wilhelm von Scholz which shows the strange ways in which lost or stolen objects come back to their owners. And Jung notes that the author of the book also suspects that these events are arranged as if they were the dream of a greater and more comprehensive consciousness, which is unknowable. He writes. Synchronicity therefore means the simultaneous occurrence of a certain psychic state with one or more external events which appear as meaningful parallels to the momentary subjective state. As a godfather of Jung's views, he introduces Schopenhauer's treatise, On the Apparent Design in the Fate of the Individual, which deals with the simultaneity of the causally unconnected which we call chance. Unlike Jung, rather than appealing to occult qualities through an astrological experiment and bringing the collective unconscious and archetypes, Schopenhauer appeals to the metaphysical, which he called transcendent fatalism. Since the idea of synchronicity originated from Schopenhauer, we can clearly see how he was also deeply troubled by this hidden mysterious guidance. He wrote. In fact, when he reflects on the details of his life, this may sometimes be presented to him as if everything therein had been mapped out and the human beings appearing on the scene seemed to him to be mere performers in a play. In the same way, the turtle in the sand, which is hatched out by the sun, at once goes straight to the water, even without being able to see it. And so this is the inner compass, the mysterious characteristic, that brings everyone correctly on to that path which for him is the only suitable one, but only after he has covered it does he become aware of its uniform direction. 
According to Schopenhauer, there lie two different fundamental connecting principles in all the events in a man's life. Firstly, in the objective causal connection of the course of nature, and secondly, in a subjective connection that exists only in reference to the individual who experiences them. Thus he says, it is as subjective as one's own dreams, yet in him, their succession and content are likewise necessarily determined, but in the manner in which the succession of the scenes of a drama is determined by the plan of the poet. It is however neither possible to provide any evidence through philosophical reflection nor experience, for in the regular occurrence of these two connecting principles, subject and object are the same things. As he writes, we at times behold the strangest of all spectacles in the contrast between the obvious physical contingency of an event, and its moral metaphysical necessity. Yet this can never be demonstrated. On the contrary, it can only be imagined, the demand, or metaphysical moral postulate, of an ultimate unity of necessity and contingency here irresistibly forces itself on us. However I regard it as impossible to arrive at a clear conception of this central root of both. Only this much can be said, that it is at the same time what the ancients called fate, fatum, what they understood by the guiding genius of every individual, but equally also what the Christians worship as providence. In order to minimize its complexity, Schopenhauer demonstrates the compatibility of three antitheses from Kant's distinction of the thing in itself, from its phenomenon, together with his reference of the former to the will, and of the latter to the representation. One that between the freedom of the will in itself and the universal necessity of all the individual's actions. 2. That between, the purely causal and the teleological explicability of the products of nature. 3. That between the obvious contingency of all the events in the course of an individual's life and their moral necessity for the shaping thereof in accordance with a transcendent fitness for the individual, or in popular language, between the course of nature and providence. Jung also attempts to distinguish the events of synchronicity into three categories by grouping them under three different types of events. 1. The coincidence of a psychic state in the observer with a simultaneous, objective, external event that corresponds to the psychic state or content, for example, the scarab. 2. The coincidence of a psychic state with a corresponding, more or less simultaneous, external event taking place outside the observer's field of perception, i.e., at a distance, and only verifiable afterward, for example, the Stockholm fire. 3. The coincidence of a psychic state with a corresponding not yet existent future event that is distant in time and can likewise only be verified afterward. Jung however differentiates the second and third cases from the first defining them as not synchronous, but synchronistic, because the coinciding events of those two latter groups are not yet present in the observer's field of perception. Both Jung and Schopenhauer's distinctions are also inevitably depending on the reference point of its observer and the time factor in which the past, the present, and the future of the events play out in causal order. Jung says synchronicity is no more baffling or mysterious than the discontinuities of physics, and Schopenhauer also points out the meaning of the Kantian doctrine that time, space, and causality do not belong to the thing in itself, but only to the forms of our knowledge. And he explains that the will as thing in itself is entirely free from all that comes after, such as all the forms of phenomenon and representation and that it collectively has its common expression in the principle of sufficient reason. Accordingly, he defined the ultimate goal of Jung's so-called a-causal connecting principle at the very last part of his treatise. He wrote, Thus that invisible guidance, that shows itself only in a doubtful form, accompanies us to our death, to that real result, and to this extent, the purpose of life. At the hour of death, all the mysterious forces which determine man's eternal fate, crowd together and come into action. The result of their conflict is the path now to be followed by him. Thus his palingenesis is prepared together with all the weal and woe that are included therein and are ever afterwards irrevocably determined. To this is due the extremely serious, important, solemn, and fearful character of the hour of death. It is a crisis in the strongest sense of the word, a day of judgment.